Developer on Fire with Dave Rail, expressing, exposing, and sharing the humanity of software geeks since 2015. Today's episode is brought to you by patrons of the show and by CodeShip. CodeShip is a hosted continuous integration service that lets you ship your apps with confidence. Choose between CodeShip Basic, a simple, out-of-the-box testing and deployment service with pre-installed CI dependencies that works out of the box. The average setup time for CodeShip Basic is less than three minutes. Or give CodeShip Pro a try. CodeShip Pro is a fully customizable continuous integration and delivery service with Docker support. It makes it easy to test and deploy your microservices and push to any registry. It's also perfect if you want to deploy with Kubernetes and comes with a convenient local command line interface tool that allows you to run your builds locally, helps encrypt your environment variables, and guarantees 100% parity between your development and production environment. Both CodeShip Basic and CodeShip Pro come with a free plan that grants 100 builds per month, unlimited projects, and unlimited users. Open source projects are always free on CodeShip. Visit CodeShip.com today or check out CodeShip.com features to find out which CodeShip product is the best fit for you. What's happening, geeks? Developer on fire, firing up geeks everywhere. And I'm stoked to present today's special guest, John Daniel Trask. It's a pleasure to have you here, JD. Let's light this thing up. Does that work for you? It works for me. Thanks, David. Right on. John Daniel Trask is the CEO and co-founder of Raygun.com, a software intelligence platform that monitors how your applications are really performing for users. Prior to Raygun, JD's entrepreneurial spirit was stoked by running a PC repair business while studying for a Bachelor of Information Science, which then led to working as a software developer at an IT services company. Driven by a frustration around poor software tooling, JD co-founded a company called Mindscape with Jeremy Boyd before focusing on the Raygun product, which gradually grew more attention. This varied background has given JD unique insights into understanding how to build healthy software. He is also known to enjoy a well-aged whiskey. So JD, that tells us about your history a little bit, some of your professional and the building of businesses being front and center in your efforts and and around software. Uh, Before we get into your story specifically, I want to find out more about you, the person. Who are you personally and what makes you tick? (laughs) Thanks, David. So I, I've always been a tinkerer with technology. I disassembled you know, remote control cars when I was four years old and reassembled them, much to the dismay of having just received it as a gift. <laughs> I see myself as sort of living on the intersection between business and technology. So even when I went to university and I, I did my Bachelor of Information Science, I picked that paper, that area of study, because it had the most electives in it. I didn't want to be at university long, and that meant that it was a three-year degree that had the most electives that I could fill up with business papers alongside the comp sci papers. Okay. And so I've seen both areas as providing the ability to amplify human ability. So technology allows you to do more than you could do just by yourself. Business is the collection of people or striving for a similar goal to help you achieve more than than what you could achieve yourself. So cool. I'm all about amplifying output. Right on. So technology is what turns you into Superman, and then business is the League of Justice, right? Bringing all these superheroes together. Yeah, I'm more of an Avengers kind of guy. Oh, okay. Yeah, there that... you go. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of works. <laughs> well, that sounds good. Yeah. So my understanding is that you kind of uh, travel back and forth between the U.S. and New Zealand. What's the story with that? Or where are you from and kind of uh, what's your current living situation? Cool. So I, yeah, I live in Wellington, New Zealand, which is the capital of New Zealand. And for listeners who don't know New Zealand very well, it's a country of 4.5 million people. So it's, it's relatively low, low population. But it's, it's definitely, you know, it's a first tier country, very high technology. There's multiple billion dollar plus tech companies been founded there. It's a very modern society. But it's down at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. It's kind of tucked out of the way. And so in order to continue growing our business, we grew relatively organically to around 2,000 organizations around the world paying us for, for our products. And we decided to focus on the United States because that was our primary market. In order to do that properly, I decided that I need to move here and help lead the, the team on the ground. Don't believe in sort of trying to set up foreign offices where you just try and hire remotely and, and uh, you know hope for the best. So mm. in 2015, got an L1 visa to transfer to our subsidiary company over here. 
And so my wife and I moved to lovely Seattle in March 2016. We've been building up the team here now. So I tend to go back to New Zealand about every two months for two weeks to check in with the team there and see, you know, my, my extended family and all of that. I, I really love New Zealand. I'm very patriotic to it, but I also really love the opportunities afforded to me uh, in the United States and, and specifically here in Seattle. So cool. I bounce around a bit. Yeah, well, that, that sounds like an appealing lifestyle and you've got a lot of good things going for you. Tell me about the business. What, what's going on with Raygun? Is it still a part of Mindscape or kind of what's the deal with it and kind of just the, the structure of how things work for you? Yeah, so we built this company, Mindscape. We started in 2007 and it was a bootstrap business and we built a range of developer tools for the Microsoft platform. But we actually also teamed up and built other businesses. So we assisted in building New Zealand's largest philanthropic website that drives you know, most, most of the sort of crowdsourced giving in New Zealand. We sold that to te- telecommunications concern. Down there, we built a business valuation company. We've um, built a couple of other businesses and helped sell them. And then in 2012, you know, we had this, this cool little team. There was about five or six of us. We were profitable. But, you know, I was sort of in my my 20s there and I was like man we've got got my own ambition you know to to do something really big ourselves and so we built this product called Raygun based on our own experiences Jeremy and I when we were working at this company called Intergen uh, which was the IT services company you mentioned in the intro and we built it to report and manage software errors and we launched it in 2013 and you know like one month after we launched it we started to get early customers emailing us and saying hey I'd like to do a case study for you guys because I think I think this this is a really important product. It's really changed wow. the way we build software. You know, that was my response. It's like, you know, I've never had somebody contact me saying, I want to do a case study for you just because I believe in what you're doing. That's huge. It was. And then uh, a few months later, we got approached by a mid-sized US tech company to acquire Mindscape, but really driven off the back of the Raygun product. Obviously, we didn't reach terms on that, which was good because we we were growing at a reasonable clip, which was great. But around that point, we decided we needed to focus. We had these other products and Raygun was just growing and growing and growing. And so we, we sort of doubled down on that. Then we, um, we got to the point where people were starting to contact us going, who's this Mindscape on my credit card bill? I only oh. know Raygun, you know, like what's <laughs> going on? So we changed the company name. So Mindscape is Raygun effectively. You know, okay. uh, it's the same it's the same business entity, but you know, within a year it was it was making more money than all the other stuff we were doing and it it continues to this day to grow really strongly. We're building out sales and customer success in Seattle and we're closing more and more deals, bigger and bigger deals. You know, we've got some really really awesome customers on board now. We just really haven't looked back uh, since then. Well, I, re- I remember a few times that I would speak at a user group, and I think I got a license for, for something from Mindscape at one point, but I don't really recall what it was. W- was that you guys? Were you uh, doing a lot of sponsoring user groups and stuff like that? We were. Yes, yeah. we were. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, we, yeah. And, and to be honest, the products there were really good. We actually use a, a bunch of them to build Raygun itself. Yeah, so we had okay. the Lightspeed Object Relational Mapper is one you know and it was a very high performance or still is and we we use that under the covers with with raygun for a lot of our data access patterns cool so uh raygun the picture in my mind is that it's called raygun because you're zapping errors am i uh close on that how how did the name come about the name actually came about because uh of my business partner jeremy and so while we're both technical, Jeremy is the supreme technical genius. I'm mm. the I'm the pretender beside him. That's why, I, that's why I handle the business side of things. You know, it was like, who's the worst coder out of the two of us? JD, okay, so you can do the business work. No, I, I kid. So when we were starting the business, there was originally three founders. We we bought one of them out, and so it's just Jeremy and I now. But man, pretty quickly, that's a that's a whole another story. But when we were starting, we, we did what all geeks did. And we were like, what are we going to call this company? And so the three of us all sort of sat down and we put down this list of names. We combined them into an Excel file. We each then went through and we stack ranked the entire list, in each of us. Then we merged those results together and summed up the scores based on position. And Mindscape came out on top. And I still just remember that Jeremy put a name in that list that was Railgun. If you remember, you know, Railgun from games like um, Quake 3 and whatnot. Oh, okay. And I was just like, 
man, that is the stupidest name. Like, what a ridiculous <laughs> name for a company. And and the thing was, is it stuck with me from, you know, 2007 through to 2012. And I was like, you know what? The fact that I'm still remembering this kind of shows that it resonates as a memorable <laughs> name. And so when it came time, I was like, well, I'm not going to go. Ra- Railgun is a little bit esoteric compared to ray gun. Everybody kind of gets what a ray gun is. They might not know what a rail gun was. And so it was a slight tweak on on Jeremy's suggestion, and you know what? It's just been it's been a super powerful name, and I was I was wrong all those years ago to think that it was that it was not a clever name. And I, yeah. <laughs> well, that's funny. It's funny how something sticks with you, right? When it made an impression of being something silly and and not worthwhile, and then and then it sticks. And who knows? Maybe Railgun would have been a horrible name, and it had to be had to have the tweak. But uh, <laughs> but that's great. So yeah, really cool. So uh, tell me a little bit about Raygun itself. As a developer out there, right, somebody listening to this, why should they be interested? Why should they care about Raygun? Yeah, so Raygun integrates with your software as an SDK, and what it provides to you is automatic software crash reporting as one piece, and that's that's some relatively low-hanging fruit in terms of the value to customers. You want to know when something blows up. You want to know enough detail to fix it. Yeah, you don't yeah. Want and a lot of the stuff built into uh, you know a lot of tools that you're using is are it leave a lot to be desired, I guess. Absolutely. And so we also integrate heavily with the ecosystem, integrates with your, you know, GitHub and Slack and HipChat and about, mm. you know, 25 other things. So you're always alert. And then we also have real user monitoring capabilities or RUM as the industry refers to it. And what that means is that we help our customers in tracking how people are using their software with a performance angle to it. So that means it's not like Google Analytics. It can tell you your daily active users, your monthly active users, but more importantly is it's telling you that this page, for example, took this long to load. These API calls that you made via Ajax on your website took this long. We also support mobile, back-end, front-end, everything. And so, you know, for example, you could integrate the run part with your mobile app, and we can automatically tell you the navigation flow within the application, the network calls that are occurring, what's taking so long on all of that. And so we kind of, that's where we're getting to the point where we're like, this is actually a software intelligence platform. It's not a single crash reporting. It's not really a run thing. The overlap between the two is actually where the power really is. So, for example... Yeah, I have a crash report, but with the RUM data, I can also tell you the full navigation flow that that user took. Nice. Or, for example, when I'm telling you how many of your customers had an excellent experience, if I've also augmented that with the crash data, I can give you a better experience score. An example I, I give is that just because, you know, you might say, oh, the users are having a great time because the web page is loading really fast didn't realize it was the 500 page, you know, it was loading really fast. Actually, they had a terrible experience. You know, that that's yeah. the sort of thing where you need to augment that data. And so sure. we bring all of that together and we track every single session, every single crash. So there's some other toy products out there that kind of sample data aggressively and they won't kind of give you the full story. But we've sort of decided to focus in on business customers where actually collecting everything from auditing purposes is important and also making sure you've got full visibility is important. So we've put a lot of work into the engineering side of our platform to handle extreme volume. So we have like one customer peaked at 120,000 errors per second from a single app wow. you know, and, and our infrastructure didn't even blink. Nice. So wow. yeah, it, there's a lot of really fun technical challenges in building what we've created, but the value is Ultimately, why do we build software, David? We build it. Oh, we okay. want to deliver. Yeah, deliver yeah. something. Something that has some value to somebody. And somebody is the key word. Like, we build yeah. software for people. And as software engineers, we can sometimes get a little bit forgetful of that fact. We're thinking, oh, man, you know, I've got all these design patterns. These design patterns are really important to me. It's like, mm, the user doesn't care. The user just wants fast software that delivers them value. And we always have to keep that in mind. And that's where our tools are all about trying to make sure that your users have a better experience and you're not wasting your time fixing bugs too long. Like a common scenario we run into is hearing people sort of say, we spend about half our time fixing bugs that customers report. You know, and it's like, man, wouldn't it be better if it was like five percent of the time, and you were ninety-five percent focused on features? Like, that'd be a, a game changer. The thing I also like about Reagan: no more screenshots inside of Word document files oh, from yeah. customers. You know, like it didn't work. Here's your error page, and you're like, oh my god. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That's kind of a, a quick run through. 
Well, so that's great. Yeah. I mean, the software intelligence platform could mean a lot of things. So I, I think, thank you for digging deeper on that. You know, it's not only what happened, but uh, some context around that, right? Here's what led to that and all of those things, things that you can really make some useful decisions off of. And, uh, you know, and I like that perspective that uh, ultimately we're serving people. You are serving your customers better so that they can serve their customers better. And so that's all great. So you mentioned Mindscape early on being about the Microsoft ecosystem. When I hear you saying things like web and and mobile, does that mean that Raygun goes beyond that, or is this limited to a particular technology stack? No, so one of the things that we wanted to do was serve all programming languages and platforms. And so we were one of the first to sort of come out with that approach from the very beginning. Yeah. So we designed our APIs to be sort of language agnostic. And then we built SDKs for each different language and platform. And there's two sides to that. Obviously, the SDK has to be platform specific, but then also the logic on our server side has to have smarts. So an example of that is when you're, say, grouping up software errors. And errors that come from IE can look a bit different to ones that come from Chrome, and they sure. look different from ones that come from Firefox. And so we, we have to do some work on our side to go, kind of go, okay, this came from the JavaScript SDK. These look a bit different. Here's how we do the fingerprinting to make sure they come together. I mean, there's also weird little things like, you know, Internet Explorer is the only browser that will localize all your error messages into the language on the user's machine. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make sure that you're reading, for example, the English error message, we need to localize that when we receive it, even if it was from a German user loading the site. There's all sorts of weird things on both sides. So we put a lot of work into the multi-platform, multi-programming language side of things. And part of the driver for that is that, you know, we started in 2007. I think the market had already started changing to being quite a polyglot one. People yeah. in the 90s were very much like, it was, you probably remember, it was a very religious war, right? Oh, so yeah. We were all Microsoft or we were all Java or we were all whatever. Nowadays, you talk to people and they'll be like, yeah, we've got, you know, Node.js in there and we've got this bit written in Rust and this bit's using .NET and this piece is Java. I mean, that's how the Raygun platform itself is built. Our API, we're migrating from Node to .NET Core. We've got a lot of C Sharp in there because we are a Microsoft house internally. But we also have Go in there orchestrating our symbolification process for iOS crashes. And that's just the nature of all tech businesses these days is that they're using whatever is the best language or platform for the job. Yeah. Yeah, that yep. makes sense. It's definitely a good offering for the public to be able to to use this on your platform. And and this is a very technology agnostic show. So I think, you know, you're talking to an audience out there of developers using all kinds of different things. And so it's it's wonderful that there's something for everybody there. And, and yeah, it does present a lot of challenges. So that, that kind of leads me to wonder, you talked about kind of, you know, early days, Mindscape, a five, a team of five, something along those lines, right? With all of these things that you're dealing with, I imagine that teams had to grow. What does the team look like these days? Yeah, so today we're at almost 40 staff across New Zealand and the United States, and we're always continuing to work on, on growing more. So, I mean, we'll probably be, I don't know, 60 people in a few months' time. Wow. But yeah, so th things are going reasonably well on that front. Yeah, so you're interested in both the technology and the business, and that's had to have served you well in this particular role, right? H has that always been something, uh, business has always been interesting to you? Yes. I So I grew up in, in a household where, you know, my father ran his own businesses. My aunties mm. and uncles had their own businesses. It's always been a part of my life that that's what you do. It's just, it's always been a goal of mine. I like to build things, whether it's in code or, or in business. Yeah, cool. So why software, right? How, how did you get interested in being able to program and, and what lights you up about uh, doing software? So I, uh, like I say, I was always a bit a little bit nerdy as a kid from the point of view that I like to build. And so I remember uh, I had this like Osborne's Children's Encyclopedia when I was about five years old. And I, I used to really like the tech section in there and it would talk about lasers and satellites and all mm. that. And I was just like, I love to dream. I like to think about the future. And um, we got this computer and uh, when I was, uh, I think I was just about to turn nine or had just turned nine. And I was going through, it was, it was, it was a 486 SX25, FYI. And uh, I remember seeing the DOS command prompt, and I was literally just going through this list of all of the different commands. And eventually I got to Q. You can see where this is going. We got, so I load up QBasic, yeah. and I was like, what, what is this thing? <laughs> What's going on? And so I kind of managed to get something to run. I think I printed some text on the screen. 
And, you know, it just struck me that this, I'd, I'd always loved Lego, like especially Lego Technic sets where I could, you know, axles and cogs and stuff. And it just struck me like I'd just been given a Lego set with unlimited parts where the only limit was my brain. Like nice. I can build whatever I want. I don't have to go and hound mum and dad for money, you know, to say I need more bricks. I can just write more code. I can do all this sort of stuff. And so it triggered a passion in me like that, you know. And so we, you know, I have a uh, brother and sister were living at home at the time and we had to share the computer for, you know, an hour each. And so I started buying their time off them for a dollar an hour <laughs> because I was like, man, I just want to keep writing code. And then so I, I taught myself to code when I was nine. And then I moved into programming in C and C++ once we got the internet and I downloaded this thing called DJ GPP, which was a sort of a collection of tools. And then I got the Allegro library to start doing a little bit of game development. Then I moved on to Visual Basic 3 when I was at the start of uh, high school. And I started selling commercial software at school when I was probably about 14, I guess. Wow. On, on discs. So I was obsessed with it. I even became a librarian at my high school for the simple fact that librarians had a say over what books could be bought. And I noticed that there wasn't a single book about programming. So I managed to go and get one for the, for the school library because you may or may not recall, but man, programming books were expensive in the 90s because there wasn't, you know, the internet was only just sort of arriving at the consumer level. But a programming book might be like 60 or 80 bucks. And, you know, to a high school kid, uh, yeah. that, was, that was quite a lot of money. So that's kind of how I, how I got started. I just, I've always had the coding bug, you know, I've, I've been writing code for almost 25 years now, I guess. Yeah. I, I, and I hope I'm still writing a little bit of code, you know, in my, in my old age. Well, that's great. I, I, I like <laughs> that uh, you were a software entrepreneur at, uh, you know, at 14 years old. That, that's pretty remarkable. What, what kind of software were you, were you uh, selling to your peers then? <laughs> so I went to an all boys high school and the internet was just coming out and <laughs> I'm I realized where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized that it was kind of beneficial. You remember in windows 95 and 98, there was like that recently used documents menu. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then there's also that, you know, your internet history. And so I wrote a program that actually would sit there and just continually clear those, uh, <laughs> <laughs> those lists <laughs> And it sold pretty well at an all boys high school. I can imagine, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yeah, that cool. was, that, then I started doing uh, little bits of consulting. Uh, well, consulting sounds way way fancier than what it was, but a little bit of tech work here and there for uh, for companies around town as they as they needed it. Yeah, yeah so. got right into it early. You know, I'm impressed too that you got into QBasic and uh, realized you could program with that instead of just playing that snake game. I think that it took me a long time before I ever actually wrote any QBasic code because I was uh, too busy, you know, trying to make those snakes not run into walls. I remember when I worked out that you could adjust the pitch and the tone of the PC speaker with QBasic, and uh, I, I still feel like that is a lost art these yeah. days. But I read an interesting article recently about teaching children to program and how it's kind of a mistake to try and teach them object-oriented programming hmm. because young people are more or less before your teenage years, you really lack abstract thinking skills. Hmm. And so I think I was probably very fortunate that, um, you know, QBasic was procedural code. There was go-tos everywhere, you know, um, all of that stuff. It was, it was quite, I wouldn't say it was super easy to learn. That makes sense. The uh, the kind of the neurodevelopment is, uh, you know, being what it is at, at different stages. That, that That's probably, yeah, just, you know, write something that just goes in, in a straight line and, and does its thing. The go-tos, I guess, complicate things. But uh, yeah, that makes sense. So uh, it sounds like a good experience and, uh, you know, great stories. I, I like all of that. I'd like to hear another story from you, right? I, there's a lot of good things, right? And I've heard about some of your successes, but I want to hear about the opposite of that. Can you tell about a time that you failed fell flat on your face or things just fell apart? <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, I mean, I've been pretty blessed with the people that I've been surrounded by, the support from my family. You know, that's not to say there haven't been hard times, but I, I'm not somebody who beats himself up a whole lot on the privilege side of things, but I've, I've walked so far a pretty blessed life to the point where it scares me that, you know, I'm probably overdue for some really bad news. I, I So I actually think one of the more challenging times was what I touched on earlier where, you know, the third co-founder of oh. Mindscape left. So in the grand scheme of things, that's not the worst thing in the world. But at the time, it actually felt like my first really big 
failure. So, you know, it takes some grit to step out and build your own business. And so we had, I mean, I was, oh gosh, what was I? In 2007, I must have been about 23, 24 years old. We started Mindscape and I'd saved up enough capital to sort of step out and whatnot. And we were, our first office was on top of a drug and alcohol rehab clinic. Um, (laughs) You know, like we were, we were doing it rough to begin with. And I approached Jeremy and this other individual about starting this business and we decided to go for it. And that was awesome. And we had some drinks to celebrate. And, you know, when you first start out, you're sort of sitting there watching just the capital dwindle a little mm. bit we, you know we had we had some great support from some customers because we were bootstrapping which was awesome but you are also acutely aware that you want to build a repeatable yeah the clock's you know, ticking as soon as you start it, yeah and so having to deal with with somebody who then leaves and so it was one of those things where he just sort of said one day hey so i'm taking this job that i got enough for and um, i've actually been going doing these interviews for a little while you know effectively behind your back mm. that stung and it kind of it threw both Jeremy and I for a bit of a loop. People sort of say that your business partners are, you know, like your like your wife or husband. I don't really like that analogy a lot, but you need to have the same sort of trust in those people. And so that sort of scared the hell out of me. I'm very fortunate that Jeremy, you know, he I don't know anybody with, with more integrity than that guy. And I'm mm. very, very fortunate to be in business with him today. But that was that was one of those situations where I I took it pretty hard at the time when, when this other individual left. Yeah, those uh, personal relationships matter a lot. And, uh, you know, we're, we're fooling ourselves to think that we're, uh, you know, these, these robotic machines that can just uh, kind of leave the emotion at the door. And I, I'm sure that was painful, and, uh, but you've, uh, you've made it through it, and there's bright times after those times. So having heard about the pain of that, let's shift to the opposite end of the spectrum. What would you say is your greatest success so far? Or if not that, at least something you're really proud of having achieved. I'm pretty... There's a, there's a lot that I'm proud of. This might sound a bit silly, but you know, the thing is, as we approach that sort of 40 staff employed, there's a part of me that just still feels really, really proud of the fact that through what we started, we can actually employ those people. They're mm. paying their mortgages, they're feeding their children, they're living their lives off the benefit of the fact that we decide to start and obviously they contribute immeasurably to the actual success of that business so it's a flywheel of compounding good good virtue but i i still just get a buzz out of that when i look across the team you know i'm like this is awesome this is kind of what i set out partly to do i mean that's the most proud part of it to me wow uh, on, on an everyday basis yeah you know i, I I'll, I'll be blunt you know right now there's this discussion going on about immigrants here in america You know, and I'm sort of in some ways caught in the middle in some ways not because I don't I don't have a say I can't vote here. But, you know, I'm I've come from New Zealand. I'm employing people here. I'm I'm trying to create a better world and not just for our customers with their software, but for the people that we employ, you know, and and grow the the overall economic activity and benefits to everybody. So it's kind of caused me recently to think a little bit more about that as well. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Immigration is a complex topic. And there there are a lot of reasons that people feel strongly one way or another. I, I, I like the way that you put that, right? You know, one of the big draws of software is that we get to create, we get to build something from nothing. And, and that's essentially the same thing you've done with a business, right? It's, it's a business around software, but it's a business itself. And that very real impact that you are changing lives for the better, that you've created employment, you've created livelihood for people, that's got to be enormously rewarding and I definitely uh, admire you for that yeah well like I say it, it's very easy though I think we, we struggle a little bit with uh, the hero worship side of things you know for example you know, I'm a big fan of Elon Musk sure. and but you've always got to remember it, it's all the people paddling that boat in the same direction so Absolutely. you know that's where I, I do try and balance it up that way yeah yeah without yeah without the employer there is no business to, to be employed by but without the employee there's also no business to be employed by <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Well, well, that's, yeah, definitely a mutually beneficial relationships and all wonderful stuff there. So mm-hmm. how do you stay current with what you need to know? I spend a lot of time reading. I'm also a believer that it's not necessarily about being only current. So I love reading biographies, especially old biographies. Mm-hmm. You know, I recently reread a book called Cornel- uh, Tycoon, which is the story of Cornelius Vanderbilt. Oh, neat. You know, and the cool thing about that is you kind of get a history of like New York and America as part of a bunch of business lessons and, and things like that. I read various news sites. I also read 
business publications. I uh, use Twitter a lot. The biggest thing that's helped is is as the company grows, is, is just trying to take off hats. So mm. I mentioned, you know, I still write a little bit of code, but I don't actually write code for, for Raygun. Like I write code at home on little side projects in order to not forget how to code because <laughs> I still, I love to create. But the more I don't try and do everything, the more time I have to stay up to date on things. I also think personal health is important. So a few years back, I started running a lot. And so I run, I don't, I don't know what it is, miles, but uh, usually between seven and 12 kilometers every day or two. And that just buys you time to think. And I think we really, really, really undervalue thinking time in this day and age. Again, tossing back to some of the biographies that I read, it's really notice, notable that some of these people that achieved so much, you know, their office would literally be a desk and some papers. And when they'd finished writing their letters, they would just talk with people or think, mm. you know, and they, they did some tremendous things. But we live in an age now where there's a computer on every desk and in every home, thanks to Bill. Yeah. <laughs> but those things are always barking for our attention. And we don't actually get that much time to have high quality conversations and high quality time to think. And that's what I find with, with running, getting out there. And it allows me to just mull over the things that I've been reading, think about the strategy of things, see opportunities. I'm fortunate that I have some people I run with, but we're all pretty comfortable with sort of running in silence while we're all sort of decompressing and thinking about things. Mm. But yeah, that, that's been probably the biggest help to, to recent success is, is, is that alone time to think. Yeah, not only now do we have computers on every desk, but they're in every pocket as well, right? So it's a, it's a pretty remarkable place where we live, where, yeah, there, there is no interruption unless you deliberately make the time for it, and that's a very healthy thing. So it's good advice in addition to being a good part of your story. So thank you for that. You mentioned books there. You, you mentioned uh, specifically the uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt story, but is, is there uh, one book that stands out to you that you would recommend to an audience of uh, software developers mostly? but not necessarily related to software. Yeah, I, I mean, I do tend to read more business books. I think one thing, a book that I thought was really interesting recently was actually a book called Becoming Steve Jobs. Mm. And the reason I'd relate, I mean, it was, it was again, more about business and, and the way Steve Jobs built Apple. But I think one of the things that I took away from it was this was written by somebody who worked very closely with Steve for many years. And we have this view in the tech industry that Steve was this genius and he was also a colossal asshole. You know, he was terrible to work for, but he got stuff done. And I think there's a glorification of that sort of mentality in the, in the tech industry a wee bit. And the thing I liked about this book was that it spent a bit more time talking about what doesn't get talked about a lot, which was, you know, if, if that was true, if Steve was that bad of a guy, nobody would have worked for him. And so the book kind of talks about actually what were his skills in building camaraderie, building mm. these teams, and focusing a little on the other side of the coin, which I think, you know, I think our industry can sometimes be a little bit oversensitive to things. We like to say it's because we hold ourselves to a higher bar, but we also have these, these people in our folklore where we kind of idolize them and we tend to focus on the mythology, which can sometimes be quite negative mythology. And this, I feel, was like a good balance in the middle of actually going... No, no, no. He, he was, he was both sides of that coin. Sure, he could, he could be hard to work with, but he also was a master of building teams around getting things done and mm. delivering things. And this book looked at that, so I, I would probably recommend that book. Well, that sounds uh, really useful. There's always another side to every story, right? So I, I think uh, we would do well to kind of temper our faith in, in the stories that, that we're told and the uh, kind of the conjecture that we hear. But, you know, Steve Jobs, I mean, it, it's a story, you know, like, like you said, the, with the symbiotic relationship of businesses and the people who work for them, it's the same with, with business and software, right? That you really don't have one without the other, and especially in the case of Apple. And so it sounds like it, there's probably definitely a lot useful for a de developer to take away from that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think as well, you know, it's a as developers, as we move up, we typically do end up managing teams or at least being a critical parts of teams and always focusing on how to better work in a team is, is always valuable. Yeah, definitely. Uh, understanding where the other person comes from is, is great. So uh, what, what is you most excited currently? Right now, I mean, I'm just, I'm loving the building out the ray gun business in the United States. It's, it's an exciting new adventure. I mean, I, I like to point out that 
before I moved to Seattle, I lived at four addresses in New Zealand, <laughs> two in Palmerston North and two in Wellington, and they were both very short distance away from each other. So to me, this is a big adventure being yeah. here. And I love the American spirit. I love the opportunities. I love the, there's like a, almost a, you know, not apologizing for wanting to win. I like that. So right now, this is the most exciting thing for me. And uh, I think my wife's enjoying it too. She's traveled a lot more than I have, but she, she likes being here. And I'm also really excited in uh, April. I'm, I'm taking a bit of a, um, a driving tour of your fine country oh, and wow. uh, checking out some spots. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Yeah. Well, yeah. well do, you, do you have a plan for that? I mean, U.S. is a big place. Are you going to specific places? Yeah, I, I didn't think I'd just like hitchhike, you know. So. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we've got it. We've got some specific places. We're sort of going to probably start by uh, leaving uh, Seattle to fly over to say Boston, head down to New York, and then and then get a car and, and sort of drive down and around through the southern states and all that. I mean, we know we can't hit everything that we want to see in a month, but I think we can see it. A, a, a reasonable number of different sites that we haven't seen before. Um, oh, so cool. I'm looking forward to some Southern state barbecue. I, I won't lie. Oh yeah. No <laughs> question. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Definitely an adventure. So uh, on the other side of that, what causes you pain and suffering? <laughs> I like the way all of your questions are so polarizing. It's like <laughs> pain and suffering. Not, not a lot causes me pain and suffering. I guess I, I look at it as more of a growth challenge, which is that, you know, that being in Seattle is our first major outpost outside of having everybody in one office and just generally communication and mm. making sure that everybody is um, empowered enough to make sure they can operate without being micromanaged and, you know, feels that they can they can achieve without necessarily my approval there. And I think we're, we're doing a good job at that so far, but it's that sort of thing which can never be perfect. You're always striving. And I think, you know, in, a, in the greater sense of things, that's one thing I like about business over software. Like with software, you can almost provably get something to be perfect sometimes because yeah. it's basically math. And in business, because you know, there's people involved, you're always striving to be better. You know, you could not talk to any entrepreneur ever and say, Hey, what would you improve in that and have them respond with? <laughs> Nothing yeah. could be improved. It was the best thing ever, you know. And I like that. It, it keeps you always a little bit on edge that you're always striving. So that that's the biggest challenge, making sure we don't screw things up by being global. Yeah, that, well, they have definitely a, a lot of challenges, a lot of growing pains and figuring things out. And uh, the non-determinism of humans is is certainly a worthy challenge. So what do you like to geek out about apart from software and business? I'm a big VR fan, so I backed the original Oculus. I'm nice. actually my wife then got me a Gear VR a couple of years ago. Then Oculus were kind enough to send out the Rifts to everybody that backed them originally, so I got one of those. I still think we're a wee way off that going mainstream, but I think it's a glimpse of the future. So I'm pretty excited about that area of technology, and I've written you know a couple of apps and poked around with it at home. I'm curious about other areas of technology around the machine learning side of things. Mm. Personally, I mean, my life is more or less consumed by operating the, the ray gun business. I don't have any children yet, so it's pretty much, you know, from the second I wake up to the second I go to sleep is, is kind of work. Mm. And, you know, I, I'm one of those people that does the whole, I don't believe in work-life balance, I believe in work-life harmony, and right now me putting all of my time into work is, is actually really nice I, I enjoy it i work with great people people really love the products giving them value so well yeah. there's not one way right everybody's got to make their own decisions about what they prioritize and uh, there's nothing wrong with making that choice if it's if it's the right thing for you so it, it sounds like you're doing what you need to do yeah well i always say no, i don't have children yet so that affords you a lot of yeah. uh, scope to focus um yeah. so you know i, I don't i don't judge anybody <laughs> on, on what they do and don't do. I do I do believe, though, that if you're not going into work pretty amped, then you should probably look at what you're doing. I, you know, I don't often think anybody's actually uh, sets out to do a you know, bad job, but some people can end up doing things that they shouldn't be doing or isn't really their strengths or passions, and therefore they can end up not, not having a good time and probably not coming across very well. So... 
Yeah, if you if you're not lit up on what you're doing, then it would be well advised to try to find something else. It's uh, you know, one of the big emphases of this show, right? Is is I want inspiration, right? I think the the stories of people like yourself who are doing what they want to do and providing something for their customers and uh, really getting some joy out of that. I, that just helps us all to be able to hear that kind of stuff and get that kind of inspiration. And yeah, you know, what you're doing is not for everybody, but you know, when you get stuck, right? You know, when it's uh, thank God it's Friday and Instead of, you know, thank God it's any day, then it could be a lot better, right? You're working in a way that's suboptimal. And uh, ideally, right, we'd all get to that point where we're just really focused and really fired up for what we're doing. Yeah, well, my biggest challenge has always been that I, I'm on Sunday, I get so excited <laughs> and to the point where I'm like, I'm going to get this done this week. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. And then I'm like, cool. And I, I go to bed. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to bed early enough so I'll get a good sleep. And then I'm lying there at 3 a.m. because I got myself way too excited. And then, you know, you suddenly you start the day and you're like, oh, man, I'm so tired. Like, I was so excited that now I've actually shot myself in the foot by being. <laughs> <laughs> and this happens most weeks for me. Coming back to your point, though, about getting people lit up about things, you know, slogans and whatnot are easy to they sound cliche like just do it and whatnot it's like you don't want to just do it you want to go in with a bit of a plan but man do i see a lot of people who make a lot of excuses for themselves to not do something or not follow through you know and everybody's got to find their own thing that helps motivate them but for me you've got to have have self self-trust yeah. i believe if i apply myself to something i will have a a reasonable chance of success at it. It you sounds know. like yeah, it sounds like you've always been that way, right? I mean, from from selling software in in high school, right, uh, or, or whatever whatever high school is called in New Zealand. I don't know if you use that term, but <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, from all the way from there, it sounds easy. So, for one thing, is that the case? Was that just natural for you? And two, what advice do you have for somebody who's not that way? How how can somebody learn to take action where they're not doing it today? Oh man, that's a huge question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I I'm, I've sort of have, I guess, always been a bit this way. Having said that, I mean, there'd probably be people that would say it comes across as a touch of arrogance. But the way I've always looked at it is, it's like if you're talking about just you, you are one hundred percent in control of you, mm. right? It's yeah. not like you're going to be like, wow, well, you know, um, I thought I was going to do this and my body just didn't move that day. Like it doesn't, you know doesn't that doesn't really happen and so I've always just felt like if something did rely on me I knew that it was just up to me to log the hours and to iterate you know one of the one of the questions I like to ask people maybe I'll throw this at you right which is let's say I, I met a bunch of your friends and I was chatting with them and I said what you know tell me about his personality and they started rattling off different personality traits which personality trait would they say that you would actually disagree with them on? Your friends think you have it. You don't think you have it. Mm. What, would, what would it be? I think my answer to that has changed in the last year and a half to two years. I, I think my story all, all along, my, my adult life has been, I'm good at machines and not good at people. I, I think that... Uh, friends, people who know me really well, they knew that all along, right? They would have probably said that I'm a, a good friend, fun to be around, uh, you know, a, a, a people person. And I would have disagreed with that. I have, since becoming a podcaster and connecting with a lot of wonderful people like yourself, I've realized that that's not the case. So I think today, my answer would be very different than it was two years ago. It's a hard question. Boy, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I like to ask hard questions. Yeah. Um, so... I often, when I ask that, people will turn it around on me and say, well, what's your answer, J.D.? Yeah. And my one is a bunch of people would, would say they think I'm quite smart because, oh, you took yourself to program when you're nine, you're clearly not an idiot, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, mm, I actually disagree with that. I, I don't, you know, I was not, I was not in the accelerate class. I was not the ducks of my high school. You know, it's none of this, none of this stuff. I would just say that I am more persistent tenacious mm. than other people i will sit there and iterate on a problem until i solve it you know non-stop and then people will say wow i must be really smart i'm like no that thing that should have taken 10 minutes took me four weeks you know um but i got there uh and i think that comes back to the taking action thing it's like a lot of people will take the first thing that gives them an excuse to cop out yeah and it's like nope don't do it don't do it just stick to it you know because it's always a little bit forward a little bit forward a little bit forward you know like 
Bill Gates didn't amass $60 billion because somebody gave him $60 billion. You know, he he got there $1 at a time, you know, and, and that's just a, a financial example. It's the same with, you know, we don't have, I'm going to take a code example, we don't have the Linux kernel as it is today because Linus sat down in one marathon session and bash the whole thing out. It's always a little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit. And getting that mentality that you just got to keep iterating and keep going. I always like the saying, there's, there's people that say, when you're going through hell, keep going. Mm. And it's kind of true. It's like, it always gets easier. We know this from when we build software, right? Yeah. But there's the, the two fun parts are file new solution. <laughs> and then, oh, it end to end works. So yeah. now I'm just doing some optimization work. Nobody really enjoys that bit in the middle where you're like, man, I don't even have it end to end working. I'm just trying to get the bare proof of concept going. Yeah. That part is always a challenge and you've just got to stick through it. And that's where I get a little bit with, as long as I can rely on me, I know I can just put the time in. Yeah. There, there's a lot of story, right? The the swamp of Dagobah between uh, Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru and all the way to uh, Return of the Jedi. That uh, toil in the swamp is not necessarily a lot of fun, but it is it is the essence, right? So Yeah. yeah. And, and you want to move fast on it. One of the other, uh, other sayings I really I always liked was, you know, if you've got to eat a shit sandwich, don't nibble. You know, <laughs> like just apply massive effort to, to get it done quickly. There you go. You know? Rip off the Band-Aid. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you for that. that I, I like that that illusion. That's that's great. So, uh, <laughs> so my final question is to ask you to provide three tips for delivering more value. They don't have to be programming or software or business related. Uh, just three things you do and recommend to really make sure you deliver. Wow. Okay. That's that's also a big question. I think there's a fundamental thing, which is that you should just always be trying to provide more value to people than what you're taking, regardless. Now, that's not a specific tactic. That's just a strategy that the more value you are perceived to be providing, the more people will, will want to be around you. And that's an important one. So really, you're just getting me back for asking that <laughs> question about what. <laughs> this is a specific tactic, but I always like to note down little things after I meet people. So if somebody tells me, for example, what, and this is not software, this is not business, this is just in general. If I happen to catch somebody likes a particular drink, or somebody likes a certain thing, or whatever. I try to note that down, because you never know when it's going to pay dividends to know that. So for example, you know, somebody might mention casually that they like, and I keep going back to drink, I can assure you, that I don't have a problem, but I'll, I'll use it anyway. You know, if somebody mentions to me that they really like a type of wine, and I'm bouncing back to between New Zealand and the US mm. a lot, you know, it's always wise to grab a bottle of that and then the next time I see them I can say hey you mentioned you like this and you know and that's just a a good way of building relationships the fact that you care enough to record that kind of a bit of a ramble but you know people like to to hear their name right because the most the thing that they like the most is themselves you know and so when you demonstrate that you've actually listened and you've actually taken the time to record something and to build a relationship with people um, I think it means a lot especially in this age where We've got social networks and things like that where we're not really engaging in the same way we used to. I feel like social networks are like that next generation after what I was talking about earlier where computers are dragging our attention and we're not having high-quality conversations at work. Similarly, a lot of technology that's coming in around social is actually having the reverse effect of not mm. building proper relationships. So I think it's all the more important to be trying to remember how to how to build relationships. So that's 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 just one tactic i'm probably not going to get to three for you unfortunately what what's some of yours give me an example i think that that uh, that that's actually really wonderful and i think if i tried hard enough i could probably turn that into three even though you were thinking that that was two <laughs> but uh, you know yeah i mean really you know you're, you're just the essence is connecting there right you know i was i was a guest on my own show once and i, I did three tips there I, I don't recall what i said i think um I, you know really uh, uh, focus on the problem is, is probably my my number one right you know that we, we get so caught up in solutions that we forget about what it is that we're we're, we're trying to solve anyway. So, you know, think more solution than problem would probably be my number one one. So, but uh, I, I think we're, we're about at the edge of the time we had allotted. Are you, uh, I should probably just get, get going here. So, but, uh, you know, thanks for those. I, th I think that's, that's great advice. Uh, before we go, how can my listeners follow you and keep up with what's going on in your world? 
So I, I use Twitter a reasonable amount. I'm Trask JD on Twitter, so that's T-R-A-S-K-J-D. And I also have a <laughs> extremely infrequently written blog at jdtrask.com. So that, that are the, the main two ways, and people are more than welcome to, to email me as jdtrask at raygun.com. Awesome. Um, happy to shoot the breeze on, on almost cool. anything. So especially if it comes with some of that well-aged. Right, right. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> and if, if developers want to try out Raygun, is, is it best just to go to Raygun.com or is there, is there a better approach to find out about what it can do for them? No, Raygun.com is the best place to go. There is a, a free trial on there and they can get it integrated pretty quick. I think our sort of median time to get it fully integrated is about 10 mm. minutes. So, uh, you know, take the challenge. I reckon your listeners should be able to beat 10 minutes. But uh, right Yeah. Well, great. Thank you very much, JD, for your presence today. It's been uh, a wonderful story, and I'm really happy we connected. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on, David. It's been great. You just heard the amazing and inspiring story of a top-notch geek. Thank you for listening. Go and find the show notes at developeronfire.com. Support the show at developeronfire.com slash support. Join the community and engage at facebook.com slash groups slash developeronfire.